and legal and general never got to see it. So needless to say, legal and general disappeared. They said, we're not funding anymore. You know, we paid for this report, never got to see it. So, you know, everything's off, no more money. So in 1990 through 1993, I had to litigate with my Canadian partners to get this company back that I had given them to get them involved. They didn't contest the litigation that took three years to go through the court processes before I finally got the judgment back. And it was, in fact, in 1994 that I, I could first talk about this. I want you people to know that this knowledge of this material is something that you just couldn't talk about in your own community. If I go to people in the farming community where I live and I mention anything about this to them, say, uh, Dave, I really have to be someplace, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, I'm sorry, I really have to run. We'll talk about them another time. And they're gone, just like that, gone. It was in 1994 that this fellow at a place called Global Sciences, he invited me and he said, Dave, we'd like you to come back and talk to us. And that's where I went. And for, I actually came and talked to a group of about 200 people. And these people totally understood what I was saying. And it just blew my mind that there was 200 people who could understand this. In 1991-92, we was handed a book from my uncle on alchemy. And he says, Dave, you need to read this book. And I said, no, I don't. I said, that's about alchemy, and I'm not interested in the occult. He says, you know, this is when the church was involved in it. They got all messed up with philosophy and everything. And I said, no, I'm not interested in that. And he said, well, Dave, you ought to read it because it talks about a white powder of gold. And I says, what? He says, he says, yeah, it talks about a white powder of gold. Well, one of the things we had done with this is when you understand that this is like a stealth atom, that the atom can be there, but it doesn't identify by any instrumental analysis. It's like a stealth plane. You know, the stealth plane flies by, and you look up, you see it fly by, and yet the radar machine says there's nothing up there. So it's really there, but the machine just can't see it. These metals are really there, the machine just can't see them. And so in 1991, I said, all right, hand me the book, and I began to read it. And it talks about a gold glass. Well, 1160 degrees, the white powder of gold fuses to a gold glass under vacuum. It's clear as window glass. And here's talking about gold glass. I said, you know, is there any chance that this white powder of gold could be the white powder of gold? Then I start reading information about this. And one of the things I found in the Hebrew writings is that the name for the golden tree of life is O-R means gold of the highest light. O-R-M-E-S, O-R-M-U-Z is the golden tree. And then I found out in the book of Isaiah, it says the latter-day David is the one who's to plant the golden tree of life that brings about the thousand years of no disease or illness. And, you know, I just begin to say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, something's going on here. And so, you know, we begin to understand that there's a whole lot more than just a new discovery of materials. It, in fact, is another form of matter, and it has implications to relate to nature and, in fact, many things other than the high technology. There is one other thing that I wanted to tell you about superconductivity that, in fact, I forgot to tell you in as much as I now know that you know about quantum coherence. There is, there is an aspect of superconductivity that is very much different than electricity in addition to things I've already shared with you. In fact, when the Meissner field grows around the superconductor, two superconductors can actually sit at distance from each other. They don't have to touch. As long as the Meissner fields touch, the energy between the two superconductors can actually act as one. Now, it's real important. The electricity when it has to touch before electricity can flow. If you separate the contact, it can't flow. Superconductors can actually sit at distance from each other, and literally if the fields touch, the electricity as light flows back and forth between the two as one. Okay, this is what they call quantum coherence. So even though the atom's over here and another atom's over here, if in fact they are in resonance with each other and their minds or fields touch, then they're as if they're one. That's not something we're used to thinking that way. We assume everything has to be close 
for there to be electrical conductivity. This isn't electrical conductivity. This is superconductivity. Okay. We're going to go through this pretty fast this time because we've already bounced, gone through it once. This is superconductivity. Okay. We're going to go through this pretty fast this time because we've already gone through it once. But I think that this sequence is explanatory and helps helps everybody with it, and I think we've got two screens, yeah. Okay, this article is from Scientific American. It's called Microclusters. If we could raise it up and read the reference so everybody's got that. It's Scientific American, December 1989. Scientific American. And it says, Small aggregates of atoms constitute a distinct phase of matter. Their chemistry at once highly reactive and selective has possible applications in catalysis, optics, and electronics. Divide and subdivide a solid and the traits of its solidity fade away one by one like the features of the Cheshire Cat to be replaced by characteristics that are not those of liquids or gases. They belong instead to a new phase of matter, the microcluster. Microclusters consist of tiny aggregates comprising from two, and that's the key, two, which we're talking about clusters, two, to several hundred atoms. They pose questions that lie at the heart of solid state physics and chemistry and the related field of material science. How small must an aggregate of particles become before the character of the substance they once formed is lost? And how might the atoms reconfigure themselves if freed from the influence of matter that surrounds them? Now this is the key sentence here, people. How might the atoms reconfigure themselves if freed from the influence of the matter that surrounds them? Now most of us were taught that an atom is an atom. And if it's in a metal, it has nearest neighbors, and if it's by itself, it's naked. But it still is the atom. Well, in fact, that isn't true. There are atoms that when you free them from the nearest neighbors, they actually reconfigure themselves. They change their nature. They are not the same atom they were before. Okay, let's go to the next slide. This is a reference from Solid State Physics and the Liquid State by the Xerox Research Facility. And this actually talks about non-metal, the glass transition. It says, a prerequisite for glass formation is the prevention of nucleation and crystal growth as the liquid is cooled below its melting or freezing point. So a prerequisite for a glass to form is that it not develop any crystalline structure with itself. The atoms not rearrange themselves. So that's the reason when you get to the monoatomic state, it totally does not look like a metal anymore. This white powder looks like baking flour, okay? It looks like cooking flour. It's snow white, very talky, and doesn't at all look like it's a metal. Let's go to the next reference. This is from the same book, and what they're talking about is their splat cooling metal. And if you melt a metal, a metal goes totally amorphous, and then you slam that molten metal against a super cool plate, and you take the energy out of it so fast that it doesn't have time to crystallize. If you can actually get the energy in the metal below its crystallization point, then it can't crystallize anymore. You've got it below that energy that it takes to crystallize. Now it's in a glassy state. Anyway, the sentence in here that's really important is, as the temperature decreases below the melting temperature, the critical radius also decreases, and as the temperature equals the melting temperature, the critical radius goes to infinity. In other words, you melt it, it's just totally amorphous. It has no structure at all. But the next sentence is the key. In the range of temperatures where potential nuclei actually grow, the critical radius is usually about 10 atomic diameters. So here's a reference for it right here in a published text. If you have 10 atomic diameters or larger, it will aggregate to itself and grow metal. If the atoms are in 10 atomic diameters or less, they repulse each other. They will not come together, and you don't get metal. Now that's just a general number, the 10. In fact, when you find out that for iridium, for instance, it's nine atom clusters, anything larger than nine grows. Anything less than nine comes apart. For platinum and rhodium, it's five atom clusters. Anything five or larger comes together. Anything five or less, it comes apart. For gold, it's diatomic. Diatomic or larger is metallic and grows. If it's monoatomic,